man has reacted in a number of ways when faced with a snake. This animal is as fascinating as it is frightening. In the Western world, snakes are not especially dangerous, and yet they have always been associated with evil. In other cultures, however, where they have been responsible for a great number of deaths, they are venerated and deified. Offering a few coins to a cobra brings good luck. When the monsoon comes, the men of Shirala organize hunting expeditions to capture cobras in time for the festival. This tradition goes back many centuries. Bajaran, who has been handling snakes since the age of five, has no idea when it actually began. He and his men are part of a snake hunting club. There are more than 30 such clubs in Shirala, and each one hopes to find the handsomest cobra. For three weeks, they devote all their efforts to searching for nagas. Work in the fields stops during this time. Despite the heavy rains during the monsoon season, they are never discouraged. The men of Shirala's sole obsession is to find handsome cobras. Cobras are especially numerous in the fields and the rice paddies. They feed on rats or mice, thus eliminating the need for pesticides, which are too costly for most peasant farmers. Without the nagas, the crops would be destroyed by these little rodents. Bajaran has found some cobra's eggs and a few meters away, a naga shed his skin not long ago. Kishan has managed to grab a cobra's tail. It is a small cobra, but a capture nevertheless. At the same time, Bajaran seems to have come across a spot that conceals some good specimens. As soon as they find a snake, the men shout for joy and glorify Amba Mata, the village's protecting goddess. This good-looking naga is their 24th capture. <laughs> it is strongly recommended not to do as the men of Shirala do. A few years ago, Bajaran, in spite of his great skill with snakes, almost died from a cobra bite. It's literally in the bag. Except the makeshift bag is a pair of trousers this time. <laughs> S 
Snakes are kept in earthen jars until the day of the Nagpanchami festival. Each morning, however, the animals are allowed to get some fresh air and do a few exercises. It also gives Bajaran the chance to familiarize the young generations with the cobra's presence. In this way, the youngsters learn to overcome their fear. In a few years, they will be handling snakes, just like their elders. The snakes are treated with great respect. For a few weeks, they are part of the community. Killing or wounding them would be considered sacrilege. And whoever, even by accident, threatens a Naga's life will be cursed, as will his descendants for generations to come. Once a week, these celebrity guests are treated to a meal, consisting of a frog or a mouse. A legend recounts that before the arrival of man, the earth belonged to the Nagas. The Nagas consented to allow man to use the earth for cultivation all year long, except for one day, the day of the Nagpanchami. One year, a peasant forgot this restriction and went to work in his field. A mother cobra and her infant came out of their burrows, thinking there was no danger. Without realizing it, the peasant was about to commit a terrible sin. Unaware that he had just killed a baby cobra on the very day of the Nagpanchami, the farmer peacefully finished his day of work. Furious Mother Cobra waited until nightfall before taking her revenge. of the peasant's family, the mother cobra slid into the dead man's daughter's house. But something calmed her fury and her desire for vengeance. The very devout girl was making offerings at the altar of the Naga. Touched by this act of devotion, the cobra decided to spare the girl. since the women of Shirala wait impatiently for the sacred festival of Nagpanchami. The cobras captured by Bajaran and his group are presented to all the women of the neighborhood to allow them to pay their respects to the Nagas. The puja ceremony is about to begin. The cobras receive offerings of flowers, milk and honey. This ritual is said to bring prosperity and to protect each home from possible cobra bites. It's a way of inviting snakes into the society of men, to thank them and to show them how well they are respected.
The day after the festival, the cobras are released on the spot where they were first found. Thus, the peasants can continue to grow their crops on the land of the Nagas without fear. In most countries where the snake is a daily threat, man has invented rituals to tame the snake's spirit, protect themselves from being bitten, and to conjure up the threat. The snake is therefore conceived as dangerous, inspiring both fear and respect. For animists, however, who attribute a soul to every creature, the snake can also be sensitive to the devotion and the respect man gives it. In Europe, too, man dreamed up cults dedicated to snakes. In Italy, a small village has perpetuated one of its pagan rituals. The official story tells of an 11th century Benedictine monk who saved the people from a terrible invasion of snakes. The monk became a local hero and was canonized by the church shortly afterwards. Actually, as early as Roman times, the inhabitants of this region were known to be renowned snake charmers. They were called Marci, and were devoted to the worship of Angitia, a serpent goddess. This passion for snakes has been present throughout history. Today, as they do every year, the young people of the village will capture dozens of grass snakes. A great procession is held in honor of Saint Dominic the little monk who, according to the church, saved the people from a snake invasion. There is great excitement in the village on the day of the procession. Many tourists come to admire these totally harmless snakes. <laughs> in the church, pilgrims pass in front of the saint's statue, and masses are held one after the other throughout the morning. Finally at noon, St. Dominic's statue appears outdoors. The Separi, or snake hunters, cover the statue with their snakes. Once St. Dominic reappears, the procession can begin. The gods of the weather seem to have forsaken the village, though. Or perhaps the spirit of the goddess Anjitsya is angry about the church taking over an ancient cult dedicated to snake worship. The process of replacing gods by saints has happened several times in history. It was an effective tactic used by Catholic missionaries to win over new souls. What's ironic here is that the church had to accept the idea of venerating an animal associated with evil. And 
the spirit of evil, the Bible recounts, took the form of a snake. The demon snake, with its forked tongue and sly spirit, was to blame for Adam and Eve being thrown out of paradise. God, in his anger, condemned man to seek the happiness he would never find again. The snake was condemned to crawl forever. He is the first animal in the Bible to be clearly associated with the devil. Two thousand years ago, monotheism became widespread and revolutionized the world. Man no longer worshipped a deified animal or half-man, half-animal divinity, as the Egyptians did. Monotheism consisted of worshipping one god, who created man in his image, and whom he made the leader of all creation. This radical change in perspective was accompanied by a change in the vision of the world. From then on, a strict hierarchy was established with God at the top, followed by man, and below man, pure and useful animals like ruminants and fish, and finally impure and harmful animals whose prototype was the snake. Another ancient book, which predates the Bible, already mentions a powerful demon incarnated by an immense snake. The Egyptian Book of the Dead recounts the journey of a dead soul into the world of the beyond. Sailing on a solar boat, the deceased has to face horrible demons in order to be reborn. The most dangerous of them all was called Apophis. For the Egyptians, this giant snake was the enemy of light, the symbol of chaos, and the incarnation of evil. Every night, this same snake would try to swallow up the solar boat, making it disappear forever. A solar eclipse was seen as a victory of the demon snake over the sun god. To be able to be reborn, the soul of the deceased also had to confront Apophis. Magic incantations contained in the Book of the Dead helped the soul to subdue the snake with a spear and then to cut him up with a red knife. The soul could then continue its journey to another life. In the Quran, just as in the Bible, the snake is a demon responsible for our exile from paradise. Abdullah is an Asawi, a snake hunting expert. In this country, Snakes are jinns, or evil spirits. Abdallah implores this desert snake to be conciliatory. Thanks to the animal, Abdullah will be able to free the possessed of evil spirits. Daughter of Satan, you who were born to kill, help me to save people. 
خالیتم زگای ولی برد سمت Every year, dozens of animals die as a result of cobra or desert snake bites. The infected meat cannot be used and the carcasses are abandoned. Abdullah asks everyone to help him with the operation. The evil spirits have to be invoked before being able to confront them. The possessed woman goes into a trance, closely followed by Abdullah and his fellow Isawa. Once the evil spirits have been invoked, Abdullah cuts up a demon to show the Isawa's superiority over the forces of evil. As in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the demon snake is killed so that a soul may be freed. The ceremonies continue deep into the night. Several people decide to enter into a trance and confront their own internal demons. Imagine the amazement of early European explorers upon discovering the existence of these rituals. Colonialists and missionaries talk about pure witchcraft and demon-like satanic customs. For more than two centuries, the Western world was beset with snake fantasies. The press invented monstrous snakes treacherous, native and diabolical, terrifying creatures capable of swallowing up innocent souls. The gigantic size of some snakes, such as pythons and anacondas, has struck the collective imaginations of several generations of adventurers. How can one compare our nice little European vipers with these monstrous serpents? Some can be as long as eight meters. During the same period, other gigantic snakes seem to have haunted the water. During the height of colonial expansion, hundreds of British sailors swore before God and the tribunal that they had seen with their own eyes. The beast, the great sea serpent. One American prophet seeker scientist had no qualms about creating false skeletons to attract crowds. The sea serpent was a subject of fascination. This incredible animal reminds one of another biblical demon, the Leviathan. Man has always observed that some species of snake never venture far from streams or other sources of water. Snakes are cold-blooded animals. To warm their bodies, they need sunshine. 
Their skin, however, needs to be moistened, which is why we often see them near rivers. For some peoples, the snake has therefore been closely associated with water, both terrestrial and subterranean, lakes and rivers, but also heavenly water, especially rain, so crucial to harvests and the survival of man. The snake has been perceived as a water spirit, a messenger capable of influencing the gods of water and fertility. century, a sacred ceremony associating snakes with praying for rain was filmed. On these desert-like plateaus, men and women live in almost total isolation from the world, as if time had stood still. These people are the Hopi Indians, a deeply religious people with an out-of-the-ordinary spiritual fervor. Corn is crucial here. Without their meager harvests, the Hopis could not survive. Drought, however, is a constant threat. So in order for the corn to grow, they have to communicate with the rain spirits. In the early 1900s, the renowned American photographer, Edward Curtis, attended one of the most important Hopi ceremonies, the sacred snake dance. For four days, we had been looking for snakes. We went out in a different direction every day. We stripped and smeared our bodies with red paint, which is considered the pollen of snakes. At the same time, the chief offered a prayer that the snakes would not harm us. Very quickly, our sacks were full of diamondbacks, sidewinders, bull snakes, whip snakes, but the majority were rattlers. Back in the village, the snakes were placed on a sacred spot, the kiva. The snakes were treated like special guests. They were sung to, washed, fondled, and readied for the ceremonial dance to invoke the gods to provide rain. In front of the hut where the snakes had been placed, the priest of the clan had set up a board which symbolized the passage between two worlds. Soon after Edward Curtis's visit, other Americans began to flock to these small Hopi villages, less respectful visitors who considered the snake dance as a tourist attraction. These images go back to 1915 and are among the last of these dances to be filmed. In the mid-1920s, after a series of terrible droughts, and very difficult negotiations with the United States government to keep their lands, the Hopi Indians decided to forbid filming of their dance by strangers. This ritual continues today, but it is sheltered from curious eyes. The dancers cross the gate between this world and the one on high, symbolized by the wooden plank. Each dancer with a snake in his mouth, goes around the area several times. Although none of the snakes has had its fangs torn out, the plant-based potion in which the reptiles are washed must have anesthetizing qualities. To the Hopi Indians, snakes are messengers. Once the ceremony is over, corn is thrown to them, after which they are released, 
in the hope that they can send a man's prayers for rain to the gods. If the ceremony was carried out with a strict respect for tradition, big dark clouds will soon cover the horizon. The Hopi's incantations will have been heard and rain will make their lands fertile. The Hopis attribute magical powers to snakes, as well as a supernatural ability to communicate with forces beyond our knowledge. Aztec and Mayan temples bear witness to the past glory of a great snake god, Quetzalcoatl, a winged serpent who was master of the clouds and the rain. From Mexico to Peru, all corn-growing societies worshipped the feathered serpent. Quetzalcoatl was often compared to a bleeding cloud whose blood was a nourishing rain which enabled the corn and man to exist. However, to nourish this primordial god, Aztec and Mayan priests sacrificed thousands of human victims. Their still beating hearts were torn out of their bodies and placed on the god's altar. Manuscripts from the period describe these bloodthirsty sacrifices in detail. Quetzalcoatl, the god of life and benefactor of humanity, fed on the blood of its people. The snake, as fertility god, demanded his due. The sacrifice, be it human or spiritual, is at the heart of many religions. If the gods are going to give something to humanity, humanity must give something to them in return. Many rituals linking snakes to fertility have disappeared although some have been preciously recorded on film. In 1935, the Belgian filmmaker Armand Denis explored the Kingdom of Burma, a country that would become almost inaccessible after World War II. In the Shan country, he discovered a small village whose living god, Amadraya, was none other than a king cobra. We met the priestesses of the cobra god. In front of us were four generations of women whose existence was intimately linked to the great snake. They were the only ones in the village who could confront the mountain god. It was a terrifying role, passed down from generation to generation. The priestess supplies a secret powder to her neck and face that would protect her from the terrible venom of Amadraya, the god demon. She must convince him to help them solve a major problem. For many years, no male child has been born in the village, a sign that the fertility god is angry. The priestess had to therefore intervene to appease the wrath of the great cobra. We followed the procession for several kilometers, climbing to the summit of the mountain.
The priestess was surprisingly calm and serene, and we couldn't detect any sign of fear on her face, despite the fact that her two older sisters died here, struck down by Amadraya's venom. In front of the snake's cave, the priestess began to make offerings to the god, throwing rice and grains around as symbols of fertility. Then she murmured some magic incantations, imploring the god to come out of the cave. And suddenly there he was. His venom is so powerful that the equivalent of one bite could kill more than a hundred men. To appease the god's anger, she has to lean over the monster and kiss it three times. the village to continue to live, for the god's malediction to be lifted, and for the women to have male children. She has to kiss death three times. By the end of the ceremony, her dress was covered with venom. We never found out if any male children were born thanks to the cobra's kiss. Snakes change their skin several times a year. This ability to be reborn and to remain forever young and always the same has given rise to the idea that snakes can live many lives, that they even hold the secret to immortality. The snake has therefore become an immortal creature in man's imagination. He is the cosmic snake, an active player in the creation of the world. He came from the depths of the ocean and created the world. He is the great rainbow snake. Tonight, the great snake god, common to all Australian Aborigine tribes, has taken over the streets of Sydney. Since a few years ago, Aborigine artists have been renewing the traditions of their ancestors and sharing their culture with the people of the city. This great creator gave man fire and knowledge. Many rituals explaining the world and the origins of things have been transmitted to the Aborigines by the great rainbow snake.
During the dream time, the rainbow snake followed another mythical creator called Ekalawan. Ekalawan jealously guarded the secrets of the universe inside him. The great snake, after a frantic chase, managed to steal all these secrets and reveal them to man. On the way, the rainbow snake carved out the mountains and wherever he stopped to rest, he created streams and rivers. Man has interpreted the snake in many ways. He has used this real creature to give sense to the world. He has imagined it as a god, a demon, or a little bit of both. Snakes are a vehicle through which we expressed our deepest fears, as well as a hope for understanding the mystery of creation, the origins of life, and the fertility needed to perpetuate it.